book of Genesis, chapter 26, verse 18. When you find it, I need to know if you're comfortable. It's um, uh, this week I did a funeral for a 66-year-old lady that had passed away. I actually was in the hospital with her right before she passed. Then yesterday, uh, Miss Jeanette's grandson, who was in his mid-30s. Um, so it's been a, one of them trying weeks, Jeanette Roberts, who's been with me a long time. I've known Jeanette, I'm guessing, what do you think, Rhonda? 35 years or longer? How long? Yeah. Right? 30, at least 30. Yeah. You know, I look back on it, it's kind of funny, H, because I, when, when I first met Mr. Jimmy, I thought he was old. And he was probably in his late 40s, <laughs> early 50s, somewhere around in that age. And uh, that was Jeanette's husband. And I, I loved him. I love Mr. Jimmy. Now, if you, how many remember Mr. Jimmy? I mean, y'all remember? I loved him. My problem with Mr. Jimmy was, uh, I think he was raised in church that, uh, or some, I don't know where he got it, but he liked to kiss you. And he kissed you on the lips. <laughs> and as a man, uh, I ain't got a gay bone in my body, but I can tell you right now, you're going for my lips, I'm turning. Just a little, Kenny, let you get me on the cheek, you know? And I, but he meant no intent by that. His, he had just a love for people. And uh, he just, uh, he taught me to love people. I, I, I didn't even realize, you know, he was a ship captain. He, he ran a boat, a sailboat, loved doing all that. But then he was a cowboy too. There was a cowboy side of that man. And he'd come out to the ranch and he'd go on the meanest horse and that horse would buck him. Kenny, you gave me some of the most sour horses. <laughs> you know, I still love you, sir. But I can't believe you did that to me. <laughs> I have people just say, I got horses. You want them? I, I say, sure, I'll take a couple good horses. Shh. Them horses darn near killed everybody on the ranch. <laughs> I mean, bucking and jerking. And, and I remember Mr. Jimmy getting on one, that thing bucking on him. And <laughs> next thing I know, he done made it into a pretty good little horse. So, you know, I, I, so I, I just, I'm traveling down memory lane here for 20 years this whole week, man. It's just been a blessing to me. The book of Genesis we find a man by the name of Isaac who is, uh, his dad's name was Father Abraham. And me and his sons, don't sing it, I got it right there. Uh, but Isaac, he only had actually two sons. He had a son who became the father of a Muslim nation. He had a son who became the father, actually, or the leader of the Jews, Isaac. This week, we saw the battle take place in Israel where Ishmael attacked Isaac. Y'all understand that? Are y'all figuring this out? This thing has been going on for 5,000 years. Ishmael has attacked Isaac again. Ishmael hates Isaac. Ishmael believed he should have got the birthright. You know, and, and it, mama slipped one over, and Isaac got it, and he got the blessing. And ever since then, Ishmael has hated Isaac. If you don't realize that, and I'm not against the Muslim world. I'm really not. I mean, I've got Muslim friends. I was with one the other day, and he pointed up at the TV. He said, Hollywood got it wrong. He was watching Robin Hood. Y'all yeah. see what I'm saying? If you've ever seen the movie Robin Hood, you know, there's, there's some Muslims in there. I'm saying Muslim, not Muslim. You, Alab you, you Alabama or American, y'all say Muslim. They say Muslim. Okay. He said, they got it all wrong, Pastor Jerry. And I said, I know. That's just Hollywood. So there's good ones. There's good Jews and there's bad Jews. A good Texans and then there's better Texans. Amen. I know my audience. <laughs> so here we find it. Genesis chapter 26, verse 18. Isaac, son of Abraham, reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled 
with Isaac's herdsmen and said, The water is ours. Who dug the well? Isaac dug the well. He redug. He got him up. And then these guys show up and say, Hey, it's ours. Okay. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well. They quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna. Have you realized that quarrels have still been going on for thousands of years? And there are still groups of people, even in families, that still quarrel, fuss and fight over stuff. Ain't <laughs> yeah. nothing like some sound effects while you're preaching right there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he moved on from there and he dug another well. And nobody quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. Father, I thank you for the word of God. Let your lips anoint, let my lips be anointed by your word. I thank you, Lord, for your presence, for ever being with us. I thank you that this week you brought Pastor Mike Van Britsen, my pastor here, to bless and honor this house. You brought Brother David Huff. Even at age 79, he's still rocking. God, I thank you for your mercies. They were good to us and still good to us this morning. I woke up knowing it wasn't your judgments that were new this morning. It was your mercy. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Dug a well, they quarreled. Dug a well, they quarreled. They stopped up his daddy's wells. It's a mess, man. I mean, it's just been a mess from the beginning. It's amazing that I, this word was planted in my heart again as this week unfolded. And I began to see the bombs. And, and listen to me. What you're seeing is a prophetic opening of the word of God. I, I don't know where this thing's going to go. But you got Ukraine and Russia into it in a major battle. Now you at war. Now you've got, uh, the, and, and this is the issue. The Jewish people there, like them or love them, and I do love them. I thank God for them. I believe they're God's people. I do not believe that they got anything over you. I think we're all in the same boat together because of the blood of Jesus. Amen? But I do know that God will have his hand upon them, and, and I've seen it happen over and over again. He will rescue them, but there's so many nations coming against them. So be praying for the peace of the Middle East. And i to be honest with you, if it doesn't happen, and it wasn't because your prayer wasn't answered. It's because there'll never be peace until Jesus comes back to earth. It's just always going to be this fight and this riff raff and things, and people are going to die. There are thousands that already died already as of this morning. And uh, some people, we don't know about it because we're rooting for the Astros or for Alabama to win or, or for Oklahoma to win. Mm. One word stands between success and failure in your life. The word is resiliency. To be able to have resiliency. As I reviewed over the last 20 years, the one word that stuck out about the little country church was resiliency. The ability, literally, the word literally means a condition whereby one actually enlarges their capacity to handle problems and in the end not only survive but grow. In other words, you get hit, you go down, you pop back up, and you grew a little. You got hit, you went down, and you got back up, and you grew a little. The struggle made you better. It didn't make you worse because you got back up. The issue is that you got back up. You're able to recall or spring back into shape after bending, stretching, and being compressed. You felt the compression of the world. You felt the stretching of the world. You felt all these things begin to bend you, and even afterward, you came back with a stronger resiliency. And this is what I see in Isaac's life. They had a resiliency to bounce back. I've told this story quite often, but when I was a little boy, we didn't, uh, uh, the lock on our bedroom door, Dave, was on the outside, not on the inside. In other words, our parents, like my parents, locked us in the bedroom. Y'all got locks in your bedroom where you lock your parents out. Our parents <laughs> locked us in. But if you push the door hard enough, it was one of them latches like this. Y'all know what I'm talking about? No, y'all, the young people ain't got no idea. But y'all know what I'm talking about? They got that little latch like that. And if you push the door, just pop it and open it, it cracked like that yeah, right there. But Donna, I could look through that crack right like that. And on Christmas morning, I'd be staring through that crack to see what was underneath that tree. Oh, I wanted to know what in the world is mom and daddy done got a, 
I'm looking in there, and I saw it. Oh, man, it blessed me. I'm not going to tell you now, if you about like Joshy and Nia's age, this does something for a young man. My brother one year behind me, and there it was, Bozo the Clown. <laughs> Inflated and had that red nose. And you punch that nose, and they go, eek, it squeak. Yeah. Eek, it squeak. It had that sand bottom to it. And every time you punch that thing, it go down, come right back up. You punch it, it go down, come right back up. You couldn't keep Bozo down. Come on. And every now and then I look at folk and I say, you know what you need? You need a Bozo anointing. <laughs> you need the, the, the ability to get a squeak right in the nose and pop right back up. Can I get an amen? amen. And this is what I saw in Isaac. It made uh, King David a king resiliency. Amen. It made Abraham, Abe, Abraham, from dad to big daddy. He stayed with it and had children in his old age. It made Simon into Peter, a little rock into a great rock, Petra. Amen. It, it made Saul, amen, into the apostle Paul. It was resiliency that made these men and women I see in Scripture. The problem most of us run into is that when risk hits us, we get locked down. We get nervous, and I've seen it happen over and over. When floods hit, folk get locked down. Amen. They get scared. They get, they get they, they resiliency. They go down. They stay down. When terrorist attacks, when the pandemic had hit, amen, folk just kind of locked down. They were afraid to come out and get back around folk. Amen. It was a condition that leaves us unable to do anything or go anywhere. Hear me. Everything in life is risky. Everything. You can't drink water without it being a little bit risky. Amen. Especially city water. Right. First time I remember, I, we drank well water our whole lives. We drew, we drew it up, ran it in the house. It was always well. Amen. Finally got a pump. You had to learn to prime the pump, Kenny. Amen. To get the water into, you know, into the house. And then one day my dad had this bright idea. We're going to get city water. So we ain't got to prime that pump no more or draw it up out of the well anymore. We got that city water. I'll never forget us kids drank that city water and spitting it out. That's the nastiest stuff I ever drunk. Until, if you've ever drunk some good, cold, well water, right. amen, I'm talking about clear, well water, whoo, it, 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 it'll bless you. <laughs> it keep, you live long. I mean, you live long drinking good stuff. So again, everything's risky. Amen. I, I'm reminded here of our assignment of the little country churches. Amen. Just how resilient God's people can be through misunderstandings. We've had people dig dirt from useless wells and thrown it at each other. Flood after flood over the years. I've watched myself and others bounce back again and again. Amen. As I look back over the years, I realize several things about us and, and about people of resiliency. First, resilient people continually seek to reassert some command and control over their destiny rather than seeing themselves as passive victims. Victims. In other words, I ain't going to let you run over me. I'm bouncing back. Amen. I'm not going to let you just control me. Second, resilient people have a larger than usual capacity for what might be called moral courage. In other words, refusing to betray their values. They're a Shadrach. They're a Meshach. They're a Bendigo. They're a Daniel. They're just going to keep standing for God no matter what this world throws at them. If people talk about taking the mark of the beast, they'll know what the mark is and they won't take it. You know, I know we get confused about all this. I see all these little internet posts about what the mark is and all this other. I'm going to tell you, when it comes down, you'll know. It won't be one of these. They're not going to sneak up on you. It ain't going to be no sneak up. You know, you're going to know it. And when you know it and you know it, you're going to know better than to mess with it. Amen. And you'll be resilient. Resilient people find purpose and meaning in their suffering. They know that whatever they're going through is not about me. It's about somebody else. That if I get sick and I come through it, somebody else is going to get sick. And they're going to have to come to me and I'm going to help them get through it. Somebody go through relational issues in life, and I've gone through it. They're going to come to me, and I'm going to give them advice on how to get through it. Amen. This is how. This is why I find what I've gone through in life. You know, I walked in here today wearing this here boot. I looked around, and there were two teenagers already wearing the same boot. And I said, dear Lord, you put my boot on just so I can encourage them that everything's going to be all right. Amen. We're going to be all right. We're going to, we, our, our feet are going to get better. Because the scripture said God's going to put us on the high places. He actually, the scripture said, blessed that, 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 that the feet of those that carry the good news are beautiful. Right. I said, God, you lied on that one. <laughs> My feet ain't pretty. Amen. But he tell him they're pretty. Don't tell God what they're not. Amen. If he said that you got pretty feet, they're pretty feet. Amen. And they're just for me and him to look at. 
resilient. This Isaac, this Isaac guy, his difficult life journey, the son of Abraham, things were not easy after his father passed away. His brother Ishmael was bitter because Abraham gave Isaac the firstborn's inheritance. See, we don't play that game much today. But here it was big then. Then a famine came and Isaac had to move his family to a place called Gerar where hostile Philistines were cramming garbage in the wells that Abraham, his father, had dug. It like pouring sugar into the tank of an F-150. Amen. It's just, it's a terrible thing to fill that well. And that well was so important, amen, because in the time of Abraham and Isaac, only one's own well made you prosperous and blessed. I can tell you this right now. You, you don't build a house unless you've got water for that house. There has to be a connection to water. Water is a life-giving substance. Amen. That's why Jesus talked about water. He talked about if you drink from me, you'll never thirst again. He told the woman at the well. It's very important to understand that life-giving thing of water. Water. God gives us water. He's amazing what he does. So when they found a well, it was a powerful thing. We're going to build a home right here around the well. Amen. Jesus, you often see when he traveled, he traveled near wells. There was a man, a blind man by the pool of Bethesda, a pool was there of water. There was a woman at a well. There was always wells when you look at Scripture. So if you had water, you could be blessed. You could care for your animals. You could grow crops. Water equaled life. The question, why would anyone want to stop up your well? You got a well inside of you. Jesus said, spring up, O well. Spring up, O well, inside of us. When I worship, the well is gushing. Amen. When God blesses, the well is gushing. There's a well inside. Some folk well start drying up. You don't want a dried up well. Can I get an amen? So what would cause this well to dry up? The scripture says in 26 of Genesis verse 12, Isaac planted crops in that land the same year, reaped a hundredfold because the Lord had blessed it. I'm telling you that what would cause a dried up well is envy, discontent, and another superiority. When you look at somebody else and you begin to compare yourself, and I'm going to say this to you one more time, comparison demoralizes. Quit looking at beauty queens expecting yourself to be pretty when you're 80 year old. Don't say that, Jerry. Amen. Don't be looking at, listen, guys, we all had our pretty times in life. I look at these teenagers. Lord bless you, Joseph. You look at our teenagers. They, they're beautiful, handsome men, pretty, pretty young ladies. And then life happens. Forty years later. We can't change that. We got to embrace it. It's called seasons. It's a season in life. I had a good season when I was young. Amen. Now, I don't have the pictures to prove it. This bunch does, but we don't. We ain't got that. But I can tell you this, lived a good life, enjoyed life. Amen. Amen. It's been good. But I look at this and I realize that there are people that are they're discontent at another superiority. They see somebody else that's better at something than they are and they get upset over it. Here was this man, Isaac. The man became rich. His wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He wasn't just rich. <laughs> he was wealthy. Amen. The word in the Hebrew language is fat. Right. He was fat. Amen. That not mean physically. It means spiritually. He was fat. Man, he growing up there. And he had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Why did they fill them with earth? Because they envied him. When people envy you, they envy your superiority. They envy your wealth. They envy your riches. They envy your friends. They envy your lifestyle. They envy your love for God. They try to stop up your well. They try to put you down. They try to say things to shove that well that you got. They try to throw things on top of it. Beware of folk like that. Whenever people desire what you have but refuse to go your route, that's envy, my friend. It's not about your things. It's your contented attitude that people envy, the blessing of God, the peace you walk in. So what can stop up your well? Whenever you hold unforgiveness towards someone, we give place to the enemy of our soul to throw dirt in our well. That's right. It will produce a loss. If I allow people to hurt me and I hold unforgiveness toward them, now I'm going to stop my well up. And what's going to happen, it's going to take away my joy. 
Nobody wants to be around somebody who ain't got no joy. Amen. You always spitting the accusations. You always talking about something that happened years ago. Let it go. Don't let it stick. Come on. I'm going to say that again before I finish this message. I promise you. Life, it takes life from you. We start producing fruit. Whenever you are unforgiving, you're, you're fruit. You don't produce fruit no more. You start stopping up other people's well. You start to dry up. Dry up. You become prunish. What is a prune? Define that for me. It's a dried up plum. You was plum purdy. You was plum purdy until you got unforgiveness in you, and then you dried up and wrinkled up like a prune. And you ain't but 13. So why do wells get contaminated? Genesis 26, verse 19. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, The water is ours. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. The word Essek means dispute. Envy leads to disputes. When you envy somebody, you're going to start arguing with them and disputing with them. They had fought over the water, over provision. Philippians 2.14 tells me this. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. Arguing. I'm sorry, I misquoted that. Do, do some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They say everything? Y'all see everything up there? Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Please, for the love of God, write this scripture down. Quit arguing with people. Quit arguing with people who think... <laughs> A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You're beating your head against the wall trying to convince them that your favorite team is going to win a Super Bowl this year. <laughs> Just because you betted on them at 100 to 1. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped what kind of world are we living in? A warped and crooked generation. Thousands of years ago, it said this generation was warped and crooked. How much more warped do you think we are now? Woo. Justin, we warped. Amen. When you warp something, you know what? The only way to get a warp out is lay weight on it until it stretches back straight again. Amen. You've got to put weight on it. Amen, to take care of that. This generation needs to cut away. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. How do I shine like a star? Quit arguing. Quit grumbling. You know what grumbling is? It's just that, it's that, it's that, what did you say? What did you say? You ever, you ever, you ever heard you, somebody walk away and blah, 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 blah. what'd you say? I, I heard, you know them umpires will throw you out of the game. If you strike out and walk away, blah, 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 blah. they don't know what you said, but they assuming you said something about them, and you grumbling. You could have walked away saying, "My mother-in-law." <laughs> Somebody said, "Well, what's mixed emotions? That's when your mother-in-law goes over a cliff in your new car." <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, you get that later. Grumbling, always grumbling about something. Hey, man, I got to keep moving in. I'm going to get in trouble. Pastor Joseph, don't use that one, please. <laughs> Dirt of disputes. Petty arguments. Three-year-olds fighting. And you're 40. Mine, mine, mine. We argue over brand names. Best v Levi. <laughs> Best vehicles. Ford, Chevy, Dodge, Harley, Hondas. We argue about our churches. Baptist, AG, COC, COGIC, PCOG, UPC. We argue about where we came from, where we're we going. Verse 21, then they dug another well. So Essex didn't work, so they dug another well. Well, we'll dig us another one. So they dug another well. Guess what? They quarreled over that one too. They fall over that one. It was named Sitna. Sitna. It means hostility and hatred. God didn't design us to live with hostility. 
He didn't design us to live among hatred. God wanted us to live among peace and best of all, love. Jesus actually said, if you hate your brother in your heart, you've already committed murder. Beware how you think. So it's vividly clear in the medical world that bitterness is closely related to the cause of disease in the human race. That if we hold bitterness within ourselves, within our heart, psychologically, we start messing up with our mind, and now we start hurting ourselves physically because it's all connected. Your body, soul, and spirit are all connected. You keep your spirit healthy. Some people are only concerned about their body. I got to get my body in shape. I got to do it. Your spirit, man, is crying out. Feed me. Feed me. You must look, must look, must look. Run, 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 run. Ha, 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 ha. Feed me. Feed me. And so we all, blah, 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 blah. And your spirit man go, feed me. And then you pick up the Bible and you start reading. And your spirit goes, ah. Oh. <laughs> Hear the preacher? See, bitterness, let me tell you what it's not. Bitterness is not a fruit. Bitterness is a root. The Bible calls it a root of bitterness. It is a root that produces fruit. Bad fruit. Bad fruit. Oh, there ain't nothing like. If you like eating bad fruit, you don't attend this church. I'm serious. I bet nobody in here just loves to get a really good brown banana and just <laughs> suck it down like boiled okra or oyster, raw oysters. Just take that good brown banana and just can't let it get brown enough because <laughs> that's how you'd have to eat it. Or get a good peach and it looks good on the outside and you bite into that thing and see nothing but brown and a half a worm staring at you. Don't say you ain't done it. It happens to all of us. Mm. So it's a root that produces fruit. All roots begin with seed. All roots. Seed is sown. Somebody sows a seed into your life. They throw something into your well. The root grows down and produces fruit above. The seed has to germinate, though. That means you've got to give it a time. I've often said whenever offenses come, uh, and that, well, help me, Lord, bring back to memory to this brain of mine. Don't, don't rehearse it. Don't rehearse it. Quit rehearsing things that have been. This is, I'm preaching to the preacher today. Don't rehearse it, but reverse it. Be kind to those around you. Reverse it. That's what Jesus taught us. Be kind to those who abuse you and hurt you. Just turn it back around. Flip that thing. Just reverse it. Amen. So the seed has to germinate. The soil has to receive it before it can produce from the soil, and the soil determines the harvest. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying deal with the seed early. Don't let it stick. Don't let it stick. Don't let it stick. I told you I'd tell you that again. Don't let it stick to you when it comes to you. Learn how to shake that thing off. Learn how to deal with it. Amen. <laughs> tell old Sam the mule. Come here, H. Just stand right there at the bottom. Turn to face the people. Put your hands on your knees. Old farmer had a mule. Boy, he loved that mule. His name's Sam. Sam the mule. What do you say, Sam? That's it, Sam. He loved Sam. And old Sam, Sam got in a situation where he fell into an old well. And, and, the, sheriff, and the man yelled, give me my shovel. And he grabbed that shovel. And he said, Sam, I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to give you a sack of feed tonight. Eat all you want, son. Because in the morning, I got to deal with you. So he threw that feet in there, and old Sam ate, and he loved old Sam. Say something, Sam. <laughs> so he, 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 he walked over the next day, and he looked at it, Sam, and tears in old farmer's eyes, because Sam been such a good mule. Say something, Sam. <laughs> and he, so he, he got him a shovel full of dirt, and he threw it in, hit old Sam on the back. When he hit Sam on the back, Sam thought it was a horse fly, and he just shook it. Shake it, Sam. And he threw another bit of dirt on that. He hit old Sam on the back, and he just shook it. Shake it, Sam. He threw some more dirt on that, and he shook it, Sam. 
Calluses have now formed where blisters once were on the old man's hands. He shoveled all day long, sweat dripping down on his overalls till he unbuttoned one side here. He threw more dirt in there and hit old Sam on the back. Sam shook it off, stepped on it, and walked out of the hole. Come on, y'all give Sam a hand. The principle is this. You got to shake it off. You can't let the seed stick. Amen. You can't let the offense stay. You got to shake it, step on it, and walk out of the hole. Y'all understand your preacher today? Amen. Now, I got to start shutting this thing down. I, I preach a lot more than I thought I was going to do. Amen. Don't let it stick. Amen. How do you deal with it? Ephesians 4.31. Let all bitterness, wrath, let bitterness, let wrath, let anger, let clamor, evil speaking, let it be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You forgot how much Jesus forgave you. You forgot the theft, the fornications. You forgot the lying, the, the speaking bad of your neighbor. Amen. The mean things you've done when you was young that you thought nobody saw it, but he did. Come on. Come on. Amen. You forgot the anger and the malice and the, all the things you did in life. He, he, look at it at the end. For Christ's sake has forgiven you. Let people go. Release them. Forgive them and quit talking about them. Boy, our church a double in a month. Amen. We learned these decisions. He said, be kind to one another. To me, kindness has become the secret sauce of my life. I've decided, God, I am going to learn to put away some things, and I'm going to start being kind toward people. Everybody say kind. kind. It's not hard. Just be kind. Just be, you, I don't like them. It's okay that you don't like them. Just be kind. You don't have to say anything. So you don't say, say I, well, I ain't got nothing good to say. Don't say anything. Shut up. You used to have people tell me, you can't say shut up. Shut up. <laughs> tell me why I can't say shut up. Well, that's rude. No, I ain't shut up. It's biblical. Hold your tongue. Don't say anything. Don't just let it go. Don't say anything. The third well they dug, they went from Essex to Sidna, and the scripture says they just kept moving away. Sometimes you just get tired of dealing with the same old stuff. You just move away. Don't mean you relocate your home. It means you re relocated a relationship. Amen. You re relocated the people that have been pouring into your life. Just relocated. So he re relocated himself, and he dug another well. And he named it Rehoboth for a reason. One was Essex, meant envy. One of them meant dispute. Now he goes to this place. Now the Lord has given us. He moved on from there, and he dug another well, and nobody quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room. We'll flourish in the land. There are times I get room here. Here's where the room is. No longer cluttered. No longer the enemy is throwing things into it. It's garbage in, garbage out. Uh-uh. I just no longer am I going to give room to it here. Uh, this well that I've got that's full of love and joy, Amen. It's able to spew out kindness toward others, even if you may not think they deserve it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to dig another well. I'm going to name it wide open space. Somebody get me a shovel. I got to dig another well. I got to do a little more digging. Amen. I, I got to get out of this thing. Now, the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. All of us will encounter multiple obstacles on the road toward our promise. The contentious wells of envy, hostility tend to drain the life out of us rather than provide any refreshing. Their waters are bitter. They are the hard places we are most tempted to quit. But the lesson here is simple. We must keep walking by faith. Even when we feel trapped in enemy territory, we must keep trudging ahead. You know, got to go over the next hill. We got to turn the next corner. We got to be resilient. We got to bounce back. There's a real both nearby for all of us. Many of us have, have felt stalled in dry places. 
we've hit a place. It's like, I don't see what's going to happen. The past few years have not been easy for some. And you may feel that the devil has been contending for your family, your finances, your ministry, or your health. He's going to throw all this discouragement to try to stop up your well. He's going to try to get people that envy you. He's going to try to do things. He's going to turn things around in your life. But I'm telling you, there's a real both for us. There's some wide open places. There's some broad places. I close with the thought of this. Rehoboth reminds us of the place God not only brought Isaac, he brought King David. King David said in Psalm 18, verse 18, they confronted me in the day of my disaster. When did they hit me? When I was down. When did they go after me? When it looked like my well was stopped up. Go back, go back, go back. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. Now go to the next one, please. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delights in me. Now, you know, I got to go to the message. It says it like this. God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. Yesterday, I mentioned in a funeral that life is often like an upside down jigsaw puzzle. I hate jigsaw puzzles unless they're more than, if they're more than 10 pieces, I hate them. I can do 10 pieces, Tommy. But when I see 500 pieces of a dandelion, I don't want nothing to do with it. Doesn't move me. My father-in-law was all into that. I can't do it. My wife and father-in-law did it all the time before he passed. But if you flipped them upside down, you wouldn't be able to see the picture. And often life is that way. We can't see the picture. Why did this one pass? Why did this one leave? Why did I lose finances here? What happened to this? How about my health? I can't see it. But as the pieces start coming together, one day as we get to heaven, it'll be upside right. And then we'll see clearly. But until then, we won't see it. So David said, God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. When I got my act together, he gave me a fresh start. Next verse. Is that, is that it? Okay. He gave me a fresh start. He stood me up on a wide open field. I stood there saved, surprised to be loved. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. Give me a little more noise over there. Father, we love you. We thank you. How many would say this morning, Pastor, oh man, that word hit me right where I needed. You slide your hand in the air. Yeah, disputes, envies, wells, amen. Now I've got a word for those hands that are up. Come on, I want you to dig another well. I want you to move on. I want you to find a spiritual shovel. Say, God, help me. And God, if need be, let me be like old Sam. Just keep shaking some things off until the good things happen in life. Let me walk out of the pits of Essex. Let me walk out of the pits of Sitna. Don't let me stay among the envious those that are hostile. Father, I ask you to bless the people today. Let your hand be upon them greatly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.